This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. For those of you who are not yet members, we've got a great deal for you. Become a member tonight and take advantage of some wonderful discounts, our informative newsletter. We've got a lot of discounts at great places such as veggie-friendly restaurants and vegan restaurants, natural food groceries such as at Down to Earth, all organic natural. These discounts are good on Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and on the Big Island. As a VSH member, you might also enjoy attending our Imagine a Vegan World support group meetings. Terry Bear, our support group founder and coordinator, would like to say a few words about it now. Aloha! Aloha. I'm Terry Bear, and I wanted to invite each and every one of you out to our support group called Imagine a Vegan World. It meets every Tuesday, except for this Tuesday of the month, at the YMCA across the street from Ala Moana Shopping Center, which is on Atkinson Street. Oh, thank you. It's at 6.30. You don't have to be vegan. You don't even have to be vegetarian. We all come together to sh have a goal and a purpose, and that is to share and support each person's grander vision of a happy, healthy, whole, plant-based diet and compassion for all beings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our meetings are full of lively conversation, uh, heated discussion sometimes, tasty treats, swapping personal stories, supporting each other. Thank you all, and I hope to see you at our group. Check us out on the Meetup site. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Members and friends also enjoy popular social events in addition to the Terry's events, such as our dine-outs with our monthly guest speaker. You can also view videos of this and many of our past presentations on our website, www.vsh.org, where you'll find many other resources, including our famous dining guide. It is now time for our special guest. We're delighted to welcome our own William Harris, MD, a vegetarian since 1950 and a vegan since 1964, William Harris, MD, is a co-founder and current officer of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Before his retirement, he was an emergency physician and director of the Kaiser Permanente Vegetarian Lifestyle Clinic. He received his medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco in 1963 and is the author of The Scientific Basis of Vegetarianism, which is now available online free at vegsores.com. At age 82, he is an active acrobatic trampolinist and skydiver who has logged well over 1,300 lifetime parachute jumps. Dr. Harris's presentation tonight is entitled, Dr. Bill's Never Fail Guaranteed Weight Loss Program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. William Harris. Well, thank you all for coming. As you probably know, diet books are a big industry, and I decided that it was time that I cut myself in on the, the millions of dollars that are to be had here. So I have come up with Dr. Bill's guaranteed never fail weight loss plan. 
Now, the nice thing about it is there aren't any books, there aren't any magazines. All you have to do is buy an airline ticket and move to the country of your choice that is at war and uh, live on the losing side because that's a guaranteed way to lose weight. Absolutely guaranteed. Works every time. All the way back to the Peloponnesian Wars and the Siege of Troy. Here's some concentration camp prisoners in Europe. These are kids in Biafra during the Nigerian Civil War in 1967. And these guys were prisoners at Andersonville Confederate Prison. Now, everybody is always thinking, it must be my thyroid, it must be that I have low leptin levels, or I may have too much pancreatic lipase, and so I'm digesting too much fat and absorbing it. But the fact of the matter is, when the food runs out, you lose weight. You inherit the food that your parents taught you to eat when you were a kid. This is one of Dan Pereiro's marvelous cartoons. He's one of our best speakers in the past. Finish your Pepsi and Cheetos or you don't get dessert. <laughs> Here are all the ones that you don't have to buy. Just follow my plan, get the airline ticket. And here is the, the book title of my, Dr. Bill's Guaranteed Never Fail Weight Loss Plan. And it worked just great for these guys because they were at Andersonville Confederate Prison, which is about 100 miles south of Atlanta. And you may remember that after Sherman and Grant agreed that they would burn down Atlanta, Sherman then took off on a march to the sea, which is a scorched earth march. He burned all the crops, killed all the cattle, and in addition to starving out a lot of Southerners, he pretty much dried up the food supply to Andersonville, which was not greatly improved by the fact that the Confederate latrines had been located upstream of the Union water supply, which came in under this fence. Obesity is one half of an evolutionary survival mechanism. It leads us to hoard fat against possible future famine. We know about that half of the survival mechanism. What we generally don't figure out is that there's another half of it, and that is that we are all very well equipped to not eat when there is no food, and we can go for weeks and even months without food because we have this mechanism built in. If there's no food, we fast. And we live on our fat stores, and unfortunately some of our muscle stores as well, but it works pretty well. This guy, the leader of the natural hygiene movement, I used to hang out with some of these people in Southern California before I came out here, and they used to have contests with each other to see who could go without food for the longest period of time. And I think Ernie was the all-time champ. He went for a month with no food, and then on the 30th day, he swam around the Malibu Pier and came ashore here and ate a watermelon. You break a fast with a watermelon. Now, I'm not suggesting that anybody go out and do a 30-day fast. Far from it. But I will tell you that nobody is going to be dead on the third day if they don't eat for two days because that's well within our capabilities. And fasting is a useful way to get a handle on the problem of weight control. I fast twice a week for one, one day at a time. Once in a while, I'll do a two or three day fast. But these are my weight fluctuations from March to June of this year. And you can see that the amplitude of the weight loss is about nine pounds. The median weight is about 145. Uh, on my eating days, I gain about five pounds. On my not eating days, I may lose five, even nine pounds. Now you'd think this is kind of bizarre behavior. Why does this guy want to do that? Well, the reason I do it is because I am a trampolinist. I should mention that 
the one thing you do have to have on a fast is water, clean water, because you can't get along for more than a day or so without water, but you can live without food for weeks. So here's my big sport. As you can see, this would probably be a lot harder to do with a belly full of food. So that's why, I've, that's pretty much why I do the fasting. I want to say a few words about exercise. Exercise is really important, but it's not necessarily the best way to lose weight. However, it is an extraordinarily important way to maintain health. I want to warn some of my age group compadres that once you get up into my age range, doing this sport here, running, is not such a great idea because you're picking up really big impact loads. You're getting between one and five G right into the cartilage of your knee. And I've seen several serious runners who also happen to be vegan run into big joint problems because of this. So you need to have some well-supported exercises as well. And bicycle riding is one of them. Swimming is another. Ordinary calisthenics are a good way to work out. But my favorite sport is to go up 34 flights in my condominium stairwell every day. And the advantage of going up is that you actually are doing some work against gravity. And secondly, you get a good workout of the quadriceps muscle and also your gluteus maximus. If you go down the stairs, all you will be doing is taking a ride on Sir Isaac Newton and you'll be putting big loads into your knees because every time you step down, the leg has got to stop the descent. Now here's another gang of trampolinists. This guy doesn't know whether to eat it or bounce on it. And this fella is working up for his back triple somersault. Uh, this Dalmatian is having a fit. He's just having a marvelous time. You can see how much even a pig gets into it. How much uh, fun trampoline can be. And it's a supported exercise. And Gideon Goat here is probably the most enthusiastic of the bunch up till the time he jumps off. A couple of foxes got in the act here. These are probably suburban upstate New York foxes, a little doxy, and this, uh, well, this, when this guy showed up, uh, the party was over. I, I, that was the end of the trampoline. So how about exercise as a way of getting rid of calories? Well, the reason exercise is so important is that it is essential in order to maintain your circulation, and without circulation, nothing heals. Claude Barnard, the French physiologist, said, what is man but a way water has of getting around beyond the reach of rivers? And that's very true. We're ancient rivers walking around with very ancient oceans running through our blood vessels with a few red cells thrown in to move the oxygen better. But the way we maintain our circulation, keep these rivers going, is by exercising. And without exercise, circulation goes to pot. Now, it turns out that you have to run about five miles to work out 500 calories that you didn't need. And a single Coke has about 100 calories. So you'll have to go out and run about a mile to work off one classic Coke. And it's much easier to just not drink the Coke in the first place. A vegan diet is probably the easiest way to lose weight, and the reason is this. Here are some foods that I put in the Nutritionist 4. It says 97 vegetables. That means I added 97 different vegetables in 100 gram increments into the vegetable category. Then I went on and put in 59 fruits in the fruit category. And finally, I had 24 vegetable oils down in the bottom category. And as you can see, the volume taken up by these foods drops off very rapidly. The vegetables take up a lot of volume, the fruits quite a bit, the vegetable oil hardly any. 
And why is it important? It's important because your stomach has stretch receptors and the stretch receptors send messages up to your brain when your stomach is full and they tell you to quit eating. So the trick is to fill your stomach and meet your nutrient requirements before you meet your calorie requirements. Now I'm gonna introduce you to the Food and Nutrition Board of you. This is a committee made up of your stomach, the Nutrient Committee, and the Calorie Committee. Now let's say the stomach has already sent up the stretch messages to your midbrain and said, hey, we got enough food down here. There's nobody here but us vegetables. And the Nutrient Committee, which is spread out all over your body in a number of very complex biochemical feedback pathways, the Nutrient Committee says, well, it's just vegetables, so we've got everything we need. And the Calorie Committee comes in and says, hey, wait a minute, you guys, I don't have enough calories. So these two outvote this guy and they say, well, we've got you outnumbered, so take your calories out of the fat stores. And that's how you lose weight on a vegan diet. You're usually meeting your nutrient requirements if you're doing it right, and you're filling your stomach before you've met your calorie requirements. So you take the calories out of the fat stores. Now, here's another way of looking at it. Here's 400 calories of vegetables. They've completely filled this stomach Here's 400 calories of chicken and there's still two thirds of a stomach left to fill and a whole lot of nutrients missing. So this individual is gonna to have to keep on eating. And here's 400 calories of oil and it might, not, it might as well not even be there except that it's empty calories. So obviously you're gonna to have to eat a whole lot more to fill these two stomachs and get that stretch reflex moving. I have a couple of rules. This is the first rule. Probably the most important rule, if it has no fiber, don't eat it. All of these plant foods here, they've got plenty of fiber. In 2200 calories of any of these plant foods, you will get a minimum of 40 grams of fiber. And that's with avocados, the fattest of the bunch. But while you think of avocado as just being all fat, it's actually got cells in it. The cell walls are made out of fiber. On the other hand, no animal food has any fiber at all because animals cannot metabolize cellulose, which is the main ingredient in fiber. And of course, refined sugar has no fiber either because all of fiber has been squeezed out of it. And the vegetable oil has had all its fiber taken out too. So the refined sugar and the vegetable oil are both empty calories. This is rule number two, if man made it, don't eat it. Because fat, sugar, and salt make the food taste better than it is. So you'll eat more of it than you should. And the profits will be higher than are deserved. This is a rather typical FDA approved label. And if you're going to eat anything that was made by the food biz, make sure you know how to read the food labels, because this is an extremely dishonest ad. It says on the outside that it's ultra fat free, no fat margarine. But if you look up here in the nutrition lies section, it says there's five calories in a serving, whatever a serving happens to be, and all five calories come from fat. So this is what? 100% of calories from fat. There's no fat, margarine is 100% fat. Your only hope of salvation with reading an FDA food label is to come down here to the ingredients list, which is always in type that's so fine you can't read it. But the ingredients are listed in descending order of concentration. So that's one way to attack that. Now, to show you how empty the vegetable oil is, here are 19 vegetable oils added in 100 gram increments. You can read the names of the oils here. Turns out they have, if you ate nothing but vegetable oil, I do not recommend doing this. 
If you've got 2,200 calories of vegetable oil for your entire day's uh, calories, you get about you know, six and a half times more vitamin E, which is alpha tocopherol, than you need. And you get a tiny little bit of zinc, and you won't get anything else. It's completely empty calories. And sugar is not much better. The only reason this sugar looks at all good is because I included coconut palm, and that apparently has got a little bit of protein and some, a few vitamins, a little bit of some minerals, but it's pretty empty calories too. So now I want to talk history, and we'll start with some relatively recent history. This is probably about 5,500 years ago. This is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, as painted by Lucas Cranach a 15th century German painter. God says, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, etc. The syntax always buffaloes me, so I will just say that this is an injunction to a whole food vegan diet, and there's no mention of eggs, fish, meat, milk, beans, grain, sugar, salt, no baking, boiling, frying, or roasting. And it looks like a pretty happy scene here. Now we're going to talk about real ancient history because the first four billion years of evolution on this planet were prebiotic. There weren't any living organisms. The first living cells showed up about 500 million years ago and they got a little more complex. They became primitive fish, reptiles, amphibians. And finally, about 60 million years ago, this little guy shows up. He's the first of our primate ancestors, and we see him just at the moment when he's about to climb the tree. This guy has figured out that a tree is a really safe place to be if you happen to be a little primate, and there are a lot of angry, nasty cats and pre-dogs running around on the plane trying to eat you. Now, those cats can get up in the tree, but by the time they get up there, this guy will have learned how to run faster in a tree than they can. So that's the advantage of living in a tree. But then the primates speciated. They got a little bit bigger, a little more complex. They had to move farther up into the tree to find food that would not try to run away from them, and that would be the leaves, the fruits, and the seeds that are already up there. And this is what our closest primate relatives live on. The heavier they are, the more they are likely to be vegetarian. A gorilla, for instance, is 160 kilograms. Orangutan is 75 kilograms. We're in good company of human vegans at 70 kilograms. Uh, there's a couple of baboons and some howler monkeys down here, and then all, all the stuff down here. These are bug-eating primates. They're tiny ones. They're under six kilograms in body weight. So the heavier they are, the more likely they are to be vegetarian, vegan precisely, because the only thing to eat up there is leaves, fruit, and seeds, and nuts. Maybe occasional bird's eggs if they get lucky. And I wouldn't say that they would be finicky about catching a slow insect if it happened to come along. Take another uh, timeline look here. Here are the first primates coming up. They're insectivores, and that's the first time we see the primates. Then, about 20 million years ago, the apes, our closest relatives, show up, and they're big primates, as I mentioned. And they're eating fruit, leaves, nuts, and seeds because that's all there is that they can catch up there. If an ape goes after a bug, it's going to waste more energy catching the bug than it will be able to recover by eating the bug. Then there was a drought in Central Africa and the tree lines receded. The animals that were living up in the trees had to come down on and start scavenging on the savanna. And eventually they started hunting also. First of all, they just ate carrion that had been left around by other predators. But then they finally learned how to hunt. 
And then around two million years ago, starches were added to the diet and we get into the paleo, paleolithic era and hunting gets started in earnest. And then 12,000 years ago, which is barely, you can hardly see it, that's when we started eating grains because that was the agricultural revolution. So here are the big primates living in the top of the tree and they've got to collect enough calories from the top of the tree to stay in business. But if they fall out of the tree, because they're living higher up in the tree, they have selection pressures. If you misstep when you're up here and fall out of the tree, your kinetic energy on impact is going to be one half mv square. If you're a big primate, you've got a, the big m factor is probably going to do you in. So that is probably why our ancestors got to be the smartest guys in the tree. Here are some things that you will not find in our primate past. You very seldom find a quadruped up in a tree. You won't find many dairy cows up there, nor chickens, although chickens can fly up. And hardly ever do you see fish. You can often see a tree in a wheat field, but you never see a wheat field in a tree, so it's safe to say that nobody was eating wheat way back then. Our remote ancestors were basically large tree-living vegans. And the genetic distance between us and the orangutan is only 3.1%, or even closer to the chimps and the gorillas. So now, everybody heard about the, the paleo diet people? The idea is that hominid ancestors were eating a lot of meat, and therefore that's what we ought to be doing too. They actually say meat made us human. Well, here's another archeologist, a pair of them actually. These are from St. Louis University and they wrote a book called Man the Hunted. You probably heard of Man the Hunter. They say we, we didn't get smart by hunting animals. We got smart by staying away from the big ones. Our ancestors ranged from three to five feet, weighed 60 to 100 pounds, had small teeth, were fruit and nut eaters. These early humans simply couldn't eat meat. If they couldn't eat meat, why would they hunt? So you take your pick of archeologists and try to decide which one of them is more likely to be right. And I've watched theories come and go for the last 40 years, and I'm, I, I, there's always a new one just around the next corner. But one thing that seems certain is that about two and a quarter million years ago, something happened to our brain capacity. The ratio of brain mass to body mass went suddenly up like this. Now the paleo people are saying it was because they suddenly got a lot of omega-3 fatty acids in their diet and that was from eating land animals. I've gone through the USDA database a couple of times. I can't find anything to corroborate that. If you look, if you search the USDA database on DHA content, that's the most elongated of the omega-3 fatty acids, it turns out that it's fish all the way. The fish have all the DHA. And that's because while fish do not make DHA, the bottom rung in the marine food chain is algae. USDA does not have any data on algae because not many people eat it. But algae is stuffed full of all the omega-3s so I can't corroborate the idea that omega-3s are what did it. The only land animal that I've found in the database, calf brain comes in at about number 50, and I think lamb brain comes in at about number 20. But other than that, it's fish. Fish have all the omega-3s. The one thing that we know did happen sometime back around two million years ago, we figured out how to use fire the one thing that distinguishes us from all other animals is the ability to use fire. All the other animals are scared to death of it. Fire made it possible for us to dig up these great big starchy tubers and start eating them. And one 
set of anthropologists have suggested that the discovery of fire and the use of tubers led directly to our social structure because it decreased sexual dimorphism between men and women. The guys had been stealing the food from the women and all of a sudden the women were big enough to beat them up if they tried to do that. So they had to stop do, doing that and they had to learn to collaborate and cooperate. I'd like to discuss briefly a hierarchy of foods, foods that would help you lose weight and if your weight is okay to keep you healthy and keep you in good shape. Here's five averaged greens in 2200 calories of collards, dandelion greens, kale, romaine, and spinach. And here's the RDA arrow. If you ate nothing but these foods, you would get enough of all of these green bars. You'd get tons of vitamin A, actually beta carotene, lots of vitamin C, lots of folic acid, uh, vitamin E. This is good food. The only thing you're missing is vitamin B12, and that's a given. On a vegan diet, you'll always have to supplement the B12. Now, it makes sense so that those leafy greens would be so healthy because if you look around, you'll see that we're living on a green planet. Green is the color of chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is a chemical gimmick for trapping solar energy and turning it into all of the essential amino acids, the two essential fatty acids, all the true vitamins, plus all of the phytonutrients, most of which are antioxidants. Now, antioxidants deal with these free radicals. Free radicals are the things that you don't want to have running around in your body because they knock over the furniture. A uh, free radical is defined as a molecule of an unpaired electron, and the antioxidant comes along and pairs up with that free electron. And so some of this confusion, which is going on in your cells right now, is made a little less lethal because the free radicals have been taken out by the antioxidants. How about grains for food? Grains have been the basis of agriculture ever since the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago. As far as I can see, the only thing they really have going for them is that they're cheap. They're super cheap. A relative cost is $1.29 for 2,200 calories of this stuff. You have plenty of fiber, but you're short on riboflavin, folate, calcium, alpha tocopherol, vitamin A, vitamin B12, vitamin C. There's no vitamin C in grains. Why are we making this stuff the basis of our, our agriculture? It's because it's cheap. The cheapness of this food created a 16-fold population explosion within 4,000 years of the beginning of the egg revolution 12,000 years ago. Much better foods would be vegetables. Here's 2,200 calories of 96 vegetables added in 100 gram increments into Nutritionist 4. And as you can see, everything's there except the vitamin B12. The problem with vegetables is they're quite expensive, $11.55 for 2,200 calories. The fruit is even worse, $18.42, and the fruit is a little bit deficient in calcium, protein, zinc, vitamin B12, and I'm gonna ignore the phosphorus because that's a, that's a no-brainer. You get plenty of that. The fruits are valuable because they're probably the best source of the antioxidants. How about nuts? Well, nuts do not look as good. Here's the arrow. Everything should be making it out to the arrow line, but it's the, the nuts are short on B12, vitamin A, vitamin C, riboflavin, calcium, niacin. Niacin's not so important because it's not really a vitamin. And pyridoxin. However, they have got a ton of this stuff, alpha tocopherol, also known as vitamin E, and an increasingly important nutrient as we are discovering because it too is an antioxidant. It's a very important stuff. 
And nuts and seeds also have, happen to have the highest content of alpha linolenic acid, which is the first of the omega-3 fatty acids. If you have that one, you can make the other two omega-3s yourself. So nuts are a pretty good source, in spite of the fact that they're really fatty foods. How about potatoes? There's one well-known voice in the vegetarian field who says that we are starchitarians. We should be eating nothing but starch. And he points out that it's possible to live for a year, at least a year, on nothing but potatoes. In spite of the fact that they're deficient in a number of things, I think he's right. I think potatoes are pretty good food. I don't agree that we're starchitarians, but potatoes are fine food. Okay, now let's take on the animal foods. Look at dairy food. First of all, there's a lot of cholesterol in it. You don't need cholesterol because your body makes 500 milligrams of the stuff itself every day. You couldn't live without cholesterol because it's the reinforcing substance in all your cell membranes and also all your sterile hormones. However, you don't need it in your diet. And the dairy is deficient. Of course, there's no dietary fiber. None of the animal foods have any fiber. Not anywhere near enough vitamin C, niacin, iron, thiamine, pyridoxin, vitamin E, magnesium, potassium, folate, et cetera, et cetera. Let's take a look at the other four categories of animal food briefly. First of all, none of them have any fiber. You need fiber, at least according to my rules, because if it doesn't have fiber, don't eat it. And the eggs are missing a whole lot of stuff, and they have a ton of cholesterol. 2,200 calories of eggs has got 2,732 milligrams of cholesterol. The upper level RDA for cholesterol is 300. The poultry is in a little better condition, but still lots of cholesterol. Meats, lots of cholesterol, no fiber. Fish probably are the best of a bad lot. They don't have any dietary fiber, but they don't do too badly in other areas, although they do have a lot of cholesterol. Okay, now I want to discuss a, a hierarchy of cooking styles. And the first possibility is you don't cook it at all. You just eat it raw. And in my opinion, this is your best bet to beat oxidative stress because all of these pigmented fruits and vegetables are just full of antioxidants. And you can eat this stuff raw, no problem. The raw fooders, they eat all their food raw. I think it's a good idea. I'm perfectly okay with it. I don't agree with their theory. They think that raw foods are healthy because they still have their enzymes intact. But I think the reason they're healthy is because if the nutrient values are so much higher than the values of the foods that have to be cooked. For instance, potatoes, brown rice, winter wheat, pasta, and 18 breads protein, calcium, iron, and riboflavin, vitamin A, and zinc, cumulatively, can't even make it out to the RDA arrow. Whereas things like spinach, B4 juice, romaine lettuce, alfalfa sprouts, which you can, you can eat raw, have enormous higher nutrient values than these foods that have to be cooked. So that's a good reason for eating food raw. Now I hear somebody in the back of the room saying, Ah, but you can. You can you can eat raw alfalfa seeds and raw beans and raw lentils. All you have to do is sprout them. And they're absolutely right. You can sprout them. And when you do, these brown lines of the unsprouted foods become green lines and the nutrient value goes up hugely. But the problem is they're no longer seeds, beans, and lentils. They're baby vegetables. So it's a semantic argument here. Okay, here's the second thing you can do. You can use a blender. I don't know how many people in this room could eat this much kale and tomato and parsley and seeds, but you can throw them in a blender and beat them up and you wind up with a vegetable smoothie that has everything in it, including vitamin B12, because I put a little bit of 
Red Star Nutritional Yeast, which has B12 added. The mathematics of a blender are as follows. The advantage of using a blender is that you increase the surface area of the food that your enzymes are going to work on. The enzymes are on the outside of this great big macadamia nut and they can't get, on, get into the inside because they've got to go through layers and layers and layers of macadamia nut. So if you break this mac nut into 100 smaller mac nuts and you do the math, turns out that the volume is a function of the cube of the dimensions and the area is a function of the square and after you've finished fooling around with these equations down here you find out uh, the surface area increases as the cube root of the number of particles so if you break the mac into a thousand parts you get ten times as much surface area for your enzymes in a million parts you get a hundred times as much a billion you get a thousand times as much and if you go to a trillion you get ten thousand times as much surface area. So this is a really good strategy for people who have any digestive problems. You can also use a juicer and that works great. Here's a, here's a whole bunch of parsley. Anybody ever try eating a whole bunch of parsley? Oh, you have? Oh, oh, you just shot down my entire show. I was saying nobody can possibly eat that much parsley. Tomato and uh, carrots and a little bit of celery for the salt and you wind up with another perfectly balanced food. If you can't spring for a champion juicer, you can go out and buy a bottle of V8 juice and you'll get approximately the same nutrition. If you throw a teaspoon of Red Star yeast in the V8, you'll have a completely balanced food. Okay, the next thing you can do with food, you can steam it. And this is a very efficient way to cook, relatively fast. You don't lose many nutrients and it works pretty fast because the kinetic energy in water vapor molecules is higher than the energy in the water that stays behind. The other thing you can do is boil it. Now here you're going to lose some nutrients, but it doesn't matter much when you're cooking potatoes because as we saw, there aren't that many nutrients in it to begin with and what you want to do is cook it. You can also boil it with a microwave because microwave radiation excites polar molecules, which water is, and so you're basically boiling the food from the inside. Some people worry about microwave uh, destroying the food. I don't think it really has an adverse effect on the food, it just boils it from the inside. But it might have an adverse effect on you, because if you get one of these little tri electrical meters, and put it right outside of a nuke, you'll see that a little bit of microwave radiation leaks around the door. So after you turn on the microwave, get out of there. Here's a complicated way. Our president loves to do this. You dehydrate the food and she's able to make a really delicious kale chips. She dehydrates the kale and adds in some cashews and some Red Star Nutritional Yeast, a lot of that, and you pour it over the kale and, and dry it out again. Now you can also bake, and the baking gives a nice uh, browning to these potatoes. But what you need to know is that the brown stuff is advanced glycation end products which are combinations of amino acids and sugars. They do not have a favorable effect on your body. However, I don't think it's a really serious problem. I'm about to come on to the serious problem. Never do this. Frying is one of the worst possible things you can do to food. It's a relatively new innovation. I can only trace frying back to about 400 years to England. When you fry food, you take a perfectly innocent baked potato with 220 calories in it, you cut it into strips and then you fry the strips and suddenly you have 632 calories. Then you go back to the original potato and you slice it into chips 
and you boil them and you suddenly got a thousand calories. A thousand calories that your body is not going to have any use for and will store because your ancestral genes tell you to hang on to every kind of fat you can find. So that's why the fat on this potato chip is going to go right to your fat stores. Leave the potato as it started out and you'll avoid getting all of these complicated chemicals that I can't even pronounce anymore because it was about 40 years since I took organic chemistry as a pre-med. The reason people fry foods is because water boils at 100 degrees centigrade whereas soy oil boils at 300 centigrade. So obviously you can cook the food a whole lot faster if you fry it. I need to tell you a little bit about fatty acids. There's two essential fatty acids. The first is linoleic acid, the first are the omega-6 fatty acids, and then there is alpha linolenic acid, the first are the omega-3 fatty acids. This is the one you need, the ALA. This one we are swimming in because the modern food industry puts this stuff in everything. You need to turn your alpha linolenic acid into eicosapentaenoic acid, which is a blood thinner that will prevent you from having a heart attack, and into docosohexanoic acid, which is in your brain keeping your nerve cells healthy. And the problem with having all this linoleic acid in your food supply is that the LA competes with the ALA for this delta-6 desaturase. And if you've got too much of the LA around, you won't be able to make these elongated omega-3s. This is the big disaster. If we're looking for the place that American health really started to go downhill, it's when we started using vegetable oils in our food. This happened around the turn of the 20th century when Procter & Gamble started turning out Crisco and then all these other vegetable oils took off. And they have precisely the wrong ratios of LA to ALA. The safflower has got a ratio of 746 molecules of LA to one molecule of ALA. The cottonseed oil is 181, the Mazzola corn oil, 46, olive oil, you know, it's kind of the best of a bad lot, but it's still 12. And you have soybean at eight, and canola at two, and finally you have flaxseed oil, which is the only one that has a ratio of less than one. Olive oil is the top of the line for advanced glycation end products. I don't know how ages get in there, but somewhere in the manufacturing process, the olive oil turns bad. We have a high carb, low fat mantra that is running rampant in vegetarian circles. And I've been trying to figure out where it came from. And I finally decided that this guy and this guy were probably the originators. This is Ansel Keys, who was a famous epidemiologist at the University of Minnesota. And he did the seven countries study that showed that animal fat and saturated fat were major risk factors for heart disease. And he did this by studying 23 countries and reporting on seven of them, which is sort of cherry picking, but anyway, it stuck that fat was not good for you. And then Ken Carroll, epidemiologist at Western Ontario College, did some more fat studies showing that fat, particularly animal fat, raises your risk for half a dozen different kinds of cancer. Is anybody here old enough to remember? <laughs> hey, somebody knows what it is. Uh, close, they're K rations. K rations named after keys. Here are a couple of some of Bill Malden's cartoon characters. The mule has just arrived, some part of the Italian theater, with a load of K rations, and the GIs are trying to decide whether they should eat the K rations or the mule. <laughs> the reason I really think it's not such a great idea to demonize fat and say that you should never eat any kind of fat 
is that there are about 100 trillion cells in the human body, and within each one of those cells, there are 13 organelles, which are smaller inclusion processes. For instance, this is the nucleolus of the cell, the reticular formation, I think, and this is probably a mitochondria. And all of these inclusion organelles also have fat as their membrane lining, in addition to the fact that the cell as a whole is lined with fat. There would be no life on this planet without fat. So why do we say that we should never eat fat under any conditions? This is the reason, because we're used to dealing with oil, which is a highly refined type of fat. If you start with almond particles, you grind up the almond particles, maybe with your teeth, the fat from the almond particles will just give you this gentle curve here. This is a plasma triglycerides. Uh, so the almond particles are okay. They don't really cause much disturbance in fat metabolism, but this is almond oil. And look where it goes. And the integral under these curves is the amount of fat that got absorbed. You don't want to have peaks of fat any more than you want to have peaks of sugar. Well, here's the toughest problem for me. I've told you that fat, sugar, and salt are the main ingredients, the dependable ingredients in virtually all food industry products. And I can get along pretty well without the fat because I use raw nuts and seeds, and they've got plenty of fat. I don't need the sugar because I like the taste of fruit. If I really need something sweet, I'll, use, I'll throw in a handful of raisins, which are just dried out grapes. But when it comes to salt, I've got a problem. I don't know what to do about eating raw vegetables without any salt. What I finally found is that you can get just approximately the same taste out of this potassium salt, also known as no salt or new salt, as you get out of this, which leads me to wonder, what is really causing the taste? Is it the sodium and the sodium chloride, the potassium and the potassium chloride, or is it the chloride? And I can't find an answer to that. It seems to me that they both taste pretty much the same. I have to mention a couple of other reasons for being vegan. The first one is, has to do, the, with, do with the environment. The present time, U.S. farm animals are generating 130 times much fecal matter as U.S. humans. And that stuff all has to go someplace. And where it's going to wind up is in the water supply. So that's a, a very good ecological reason not to use animal food. Poop comes with the territory, and you know we're doing enough damage to the environment by ourselves without asking the animals to come in and help us. I have to also mention the ethical aspect of a diet. It's been said that you have to kill in order to live, and that is literally true. You do have to kill something. But the question is, what are you going to kill? Are you going to kill a plant or an animal? Plant life is characterized by growth, metabolism, movement, reproduction, and response to stimulus. Animal life is characterized by growth, metabolism, movement, reproduction, and response to stimulus. But the animal also has a nervous system. Nervous system is not present in a plant. And the animal is obviously conscious. So there's a difference between slicing this tomato, which I have been accused of assassinating in the past, and killing this sheep, which I have never done. Back to the, your food and nutrition board, only this is not your food and nutrition board. This, uh, these, these are the folks in a government that are causing all the disease in this country. The USDA gives money only to the most destructive and worthless agricultural products grown in this country. The FDA then allows scandalously dishonest labeling and the Internal Revenue Service allows tax deductions for its advertising.
If I have one small suggestion, I think that anybody that goes on a vegan diet needs to get a vitamin B12 level checked every year, probably a vitamin D level. I put quotes around it because it's not really a vitamin, but ask your doc about D. Homocysteine is a possibility and omega-3 fatty acids are also a possibility. Conclusion. Whole food vegan diet. Large animals live on plants because physics makes eating other animals impractical. No animal species or human society ever arbitrarily restricted its diet choices. We're doing that here in the vegan society. We've been adaptive omnivores for at least four million years but we still have vegetarian genes because we're still able to eat the same food that our closest primate relatives live on and because it's possible for modern humans to be successful vegans. And environmental, ethical, and health considerations now make some variant of a whole food vegan diet imperative. And I thank you all for listening. I'll take a couple of questions, I guess. Thank you very much. Question back there. Is there, is there a difference between frying and sauteing? I don't think so. Because anytime you're using oil and you're heating it up, you are taking a shortcut in your cooking. You're making the cooking time shorter, but you're still coating the food with, with fat. And it's 100% fat. You can saute with water, but I'd rather just steam it. Do I ever use olive oil? I'm a sucker for olive oil, but I try not to overuse it. I never cook with it. I don't think you should ever heat up any oil. When you heat up oil, you get all kinds of weird chemicals. And I think we should end it there, and I will ask our president to sign me out. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. William Harris, for this really enjoyable and informative presentation. We invite you now to come and have some delicious vegan food, courtesy of Down to Earth. Thank you so much for coming. Have a safe return home tonight. Mahalo. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.